All right, it's now a few minutes after 2 p.m. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar on how does the recent SCOTUS decision impact the uh, current accessibility legal landscape. My name is Laura Goslin. I'm the event manager and marketing analyst here at BQ Systems. I'm gonna take care of a few housekeeping things and introduce our panelists. And I'll also be help, uh, helping with moderating any questions our attendees have at the end of today's webinar. So without further ado, um, you all might have noticed that we have live captions um, integrated here at Zoom. We'll also be putting a stream text link into chat uh, for those who may need it. Please note that we're also recording today's uh, webinar. We'll be sending out a recording of the webinar to all attendees uh, along um, with any of the slides that we have here today. So the first panelist we have uh, this Eve Hill. Eve comes to us from Brown Goldstein Levy. She is the compliance risk management, uh, legal compliance risk management um, point of contact at the organization. She's one of the nation's leading disability rights attorneys. Um, from 2001 to January 2017, Eve served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the U.S. Department of Justice um, and Civil Rights Divisions. We are happy to have her, her with us here today. Next, we have um, Preeti Kumar. Preeti is the CEO of DQ Systems. She founded DQ in 1999 with the vision of unifying web um, access, both from the user and the technology perspective. Preeti has been engraved in the digital accessibility community for 20 years. Um, simply put, she lives and breathes digital accessibility. Um, so with those intros, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Preeti and, Il, and Eve. Thank you, Laura, uh, for the very kind introduction and welcome, Eve, uh, to this discussion, which I'm hoping is going to really shed some new, well, give your insights into the legal perspective. And of course, I'll jump in with the technical perspective. I've known Eve for, uh, well, close to 15 or more years. I don't even remember it's been that long. And um, it's been a privilege because Eve has been uh, an advocate for digital equality and people with disabilities for as long as I've known her and much longer. Uh, I think Eve, your dedication at the Department of Justice and since at Brown Goldstein mm -hmm. Levy has been quite an inspiration to many of us working in the field. And I personally consider you one of my uh, uh, mentors in the field. So very happy to well, be having something. this <laughs> discussion with you. Yes, it is true. <sighs> well, you know, Eve, so as we get started, I think my purpose today is to really educate folks that are attending on both the legal and the technical perspective. but. You know, when I think about uh, the whole background on this landmark Domino's case, where it stands today, you know, what, how did it get to this point? I, I think I'd like you to start that off, the discussion off with a legal background, and I'll jump in into what I think about just the background on the case, as well as where we stand today with respect to that from a technical perspective. So all yours. Sure. Well, great. Thanks, Preeti. Um, it's an honor to be here with you, just because, <laughs> partly because you've been doing this so long and you do live and breathe it, but also yes. because I can't talk about the technology. I can only talk about <laughs> the world. Yeah. Um, so the Domino case, I actually think, wasn't a landmark. It's just the latest. Um, the district court in the Domino's case found that the ADA applied to Domino's website and requires effective communication, but dismissed the case without prejudice under the doctrine of primary jurisdiction, meaning the plaintiff had to wait until the Department of Justice issues regulations saying what the accessibility standard is for websites. Now, every other court that's addressed that has said, no, primary jurisdiction doesn't apply here. We don't have to wait for the Justice Department. And it's not a violation of due process to require companies to comply with the ADA mandates. So this went up to the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit confirmed as it did in 2008 in the uh, National Federation of the Blind versus Target case 
that the statute, the ADA, applies to services of a place of public accommodation, not services in a place of public accommodation. So the ADA was not limited to things in a physical space, but if a website has a nexus to a physical space, then that website needs to be accessible. And Domino's sought certiorari from the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court denied that, refused to, refused to hear the case. So the law remains as it is in the Ninth Circuit, the, basically that websites of a public accommodation are required to be accessible if the website has a nexus to the place where the public accommodation operate, operates. And this case will now go back to the district court for trial. Um, and the, the interesting thing is the Ninth Circuit is actually one of the more conservative circuits on this issue of when websites are covered. Is that so? Wow. Yes, okay. Sir. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay. So the Ninth Circuit Court is more conservative in uh, considering statements like, um, which have been made before, this is not new either, that it's an undue burden to make the websites and mobile applications accessible and that the goalpost is moving because the technical standards are in flux, you know. So even that mm -hmm. argument has been made before, right? Not the first time. Well, that's right. And that argument hasn't been tried yet in the Domino's case. So the Ninth Circuit hasn't said anything about what's an undue burden. They have said uh, the ADA standard is effective communication. So uh, companies can achieve compliance if they make sure that everything communicated through the website, either outward to the customers or inward from the customers, is <clears throat> accessible for people who are blind, people with mm -hmm. uh, manual dexterity impairments, and so forth. So effective communication is the standard. And a more technical standard can be used. So the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines uh, 2.0 and 2.1 have been found to be uh, to meet that standard of effective communication. Um, but if there's another way of making something communicate effectively, then companies are free to use that. Hmm. Yeah, and this is really interesting because even though from a, technology, a technological perspective, in terms of standards, there may have been a shift from 1.0 to 2.0 to now 2.1 as uh, the new standard, the latest from W3C. I, I think, um, and, and, you know, effective communications on the web, as I've said for at least a decade now, it's about meeting all of Maslow's hierarchy of needs on the web uh -huh. today, right? But I think from uh, another uh, technological perspective, I see native mobile apps and the pervasiveness of mobile apps becoming more and more critical in these uh, uh, you know, lawsuits, complaints. And the reason is because the assistive technology that is built into these mm -hmm. um, smartphones is really free, it's built in, and frankly, it's more convenient. I think all of us tend to use our smartphone when we're out and about. We don't really have a laptop in front of us propped up mm -hmm. to do things. And I think people with disabilities are no exception. And given the fact that uh, um, iOS devices have voiceover built in and Android devices have talkback built in makes it even more important to consider, in my opinion, the native mobile applications from a technology perspective, right? right? So is it even, is it easier to make apps accessible than You know, websites? that's a great question. Um, I think Let's put it this way, across the board, because of the automation and how far it's come, and you know that it's been my mantra to automate uh, the testing of web accessibility and shift it left, mean, meaning prevent developers from ever introducing accessibility <laughs> defects, you know, stop the bleeding, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, I think because of the increased automation and because of technology vendors like um, Facebook, who have a very big platform, uh, vendors like Google, who are really looking at uh, standards for uh, Android developers, same with Apple, with iOS, it is 
very much less expensive um, to make websites and mobile applications accessible today than, say, it was in 2008 when we mm -hmm. had another big case uh, that we can talk about next, Eve. But from my perspective, mobile applications, we've got, I know, a lot of effort that we're putting into automating those standards. Google has also done the same. Um, so I really don't see it to be a more difficult burden. I don't. I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, you do have to consider an extra layer of requirements maybe for mobile applications. But on the other hand, um, the mobile technology vendors have actually really given great guidance to mobile developers. Mm. And iOS, almost hard to break, you know, accessibility <laughs> in an iOS app. So, but going back to 2008, um, how does this recent decision about Domino's, in your opinion, Eve, compare to the target ruling of 2008? Well, it's really the Ninth Circuit just confirmed what it had said in the Target case in 2008. Um, so, and the Supreme Court refused to, to change that, to overrule that or set any other, uh, take any other approach. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what's happened since Target is that courts are less, well, people with disabilities and courts are less patient with the lack of access mm -hmm. to people, to companies, mobile, web, mobile apps and websites because it's been a long time now. <laughs> uh, people can't say they didn't know they had to do this. It's been 11 years. Um, so now when courts do issue orders requiring accessibility, um, and when, as we did in a case we recently handled the, against the Los Angeles Community wow. College District, they set very fast timelines. So if you had started your website, you know, accessibility at the beginning, you'd be done and okay now. Mm -hmm. If you started it late, you might set a one-year uh, timeline to get everything done and prioritize things. But Los Angeles Community College bought it all the way uh, through the trial, and the court has ordered them to fix everything within a year. The website, wow. their library offerings, their learning management, their course software, everything. Um, and so they, they are, they're going to have to scramble to get that done. So they could have saved a lot of time and money and energy by starting to work on it when the lawsuit was filed or before. Well, you know, that's really interesting because I've looked into the undue tech burden and frankly, with the state the technology is in today, in some cases, it's almost an undue tech burden to break the accessibility, believe it or not, right? I, I right. don't think that argument is uh, valid anymore today with all the tools and technologies to help people and all the education that has been done over the years uh, of the developers. And this Los Angeles Community College case is really actually very interesting to me because leave alone the millions in legal fees, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's the pure disruption of somebody telling you your next one year's uh, basic roadmap and backlog of things you have to do on the web, in your LMS, in your mobile apps. That's like basically putting a code freeze on everything else because they've given a one year deadline. Wow. Right, because they disruptive. failed to prioritize it. They yeah. failed to prioritize it for years. So the courts now say, well, yeah. you're going to prioritize it now. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, I understand in a way when something is unknown that it can be intimidating. Mm -hmm. Meaning that I, I think it's really important to tell the audience that the goalpost is not moving here. The standards mm -hmm. are very well known, very well interpreted, and mature standards from the governing body of the World Wide Web. The, the, the people who brought us the standard of, say, HTTP protocol or, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the backbone of the Internet, the IP uh, protocols. So this is not taken lightly by the, the W3C 
uh, working groups or the committees that actually take a long time to make something a standard so that it's not a moving goalpost, right? Well, that's right. And it's a, it's a consensus standard. The standard was developed not by just people with disabilities or disability rights lawyers. It was developed yeah. by companies and experts and governments. I mean, we really, it, it, it's a real world standard. Actually, that's a very good point. It had participation from all the major tech companies, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's really interesting to me, Eve, because as I contemplate and I want your opinion on this. As we contemplate the Domino's case going back to the district court and thinking about what does that mean for the future of something that I know, if I breathe and live every day, digital equality, what does it mean for the future of digital accessibility case law? I really want to hear that from you. I mean, because I, I'm sitting here scratching my head and I'm not really sure what's different. Well, there isn't much different. I think the trial, the, the case will go back to the district court for trial, maybe settlement negotiations. I think the issue that Domino's has raised and that others raise is, well, I provide it. You can call us on the phone and, and you can order your pizza that way, or you can uh, ask us what's on the website and we'll search for you. And um, so that remains a legal yeah. issue. To what extent can you rely on some other means to provide effective communication? Now, the California Court of Appeals has said that's not sufficient. For a number of reasons, uh, you know, largely those phone lines are, are rarely staffed 24 seven. You can't browse the, all the options available. You often can't get the online specials, coupons, other things that are offered only online. And you have to deal with, and then you have to deal with lack of your privacy. You have to turn your credit card over to a human being who can then do God knows what with it. And your independence. I want to be able to do this when I want to be able to do this. Yeah. not when it's convenient for somebody else. And then you deal with the person being distracted and there being a lot of noise in the background. I have a very simple name, seven letters, and I still have to spell it for people when I call <laughs> <laughs> because they can't hear me. <laughs> yeah, I have to actually spell every time. So I don't have such a simple name and I have to spell it out every single time. And, you know, I think about that too, uh, because Robles' lawyer, uh, lawyer, amongst other things, states that ambient noise um, can distract from and interfering with the accurate taking of orders. And I've been in noisy places. And in fact, I've been on an airplane with 30 minutes or 40 minutes to land right before it goes under the 10,000 feet with <laughs> dinner on my mind and I've ordered pizza from the plane. I couldn't really make a phone call on the plane because right. that's not allowed, <laughs> right? So I, I totally understand the ambient noise and frankly, the situations that we are on that may not allow for anything but an internet order to take place. And frankly, if you bring up a really interesting point, there is a, a new juxtaposition between privacy laws, right, in California, for mm -hmm. example, with COPA, and this whole um, idea of saying that a phone line is going to give you the same level of privacy is simply not accurate, right? Because you think about having your, I mean, being in a public place and weeding out a credit card number, I would never do that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. right? Right, so I think it is a greater risk to privacy and we're seeing greater and greater privacy regulations address accessibility, don't you think? Absolutely, right. uh, the CCPA in California, as you mentioned, oh, uh, addresses the, the, the privacy notices in that law that states they have to be accessible to people with disabilities. So uh, right now, companies are, are thinking, well, maybe I'll get away with just having two things on my website be accessible, the okay. privacy notification and the phone line. <laughs> well, you might as well make the rest of it accessible. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, how can you restrict the privacy of an individual just to simply, uh, um, you know, a phone line or the privacy statement? That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't know. 
<laughs> in your opinion, Eve, because I'm, an, I'm no legal expert. I live in the world of technology that you said it's better left off to people like me. And I, you know, <laughs> but I think um, the legal precedence and the interpretation of uh, just what this means in a legal landscape is best left to experts like you. And I wonder, do we need another ruling, you think? Do we need? Well, not on this issue. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, the, the real, the issue that was in the Domino's case is about whether, uh, well, I, it's not even in that case. The, the, the issue that's being addressed in the circuits right now is whether either all websites are accessible that are run by a public accommodation, regardless of whether the a website has a nexus to a physical place or whether only the websites that have a nexus to a physical place are covered. So the Ninth Circuit says your website is covered if it has a nexus to a physical place of business. Yeah. The Sixth Circuit and the Third Circuit haven't dealt with websites, but they've dealt with insurance policies. And yeah. they said, you also have to have a nexus. So that's three that say they're covered if they have a nexus. And it's not clear what nexus was, was required. Then others, the first, second, and seventh, have indicated in insurance cases again, that websites have to be accessible even if they don't have a nexus to a physical place. If they're, so if they're online only public accommodation, then they're covered too. And in fact, Judge yeah. Popner, who's not well known as a you know, left-leaning liberal, <laughs> said Title III applies to a store, hotel, restaurant, dentist's office, travel agency, theater, website, or other facility, whether in physical space or in electronic space and said an insurance company can no more refuse to sell a policy to a disabled person over the internet than a furniture store can refuse to sell furniture to a disabled person who enters the store. So yeah. those circuits, three circuits, seem not to make any distinction between websites of a physical place and online only entities. Some haven't said anything. The fourth, fifth, and 10th circuits haven't said anything about this. And the 11th circuit is right now mm -hmm. considering Gill versus Winn-Dixie where the trial resulted in an order that when Dixie has to make its accessible, its website accessible, applying WCAG 2.0, including third party uh, content on the website. Mm -hmm. So everything, yeah. the coupons, prescription management, management, store locations, all are services of that public accommodation. Um, so the 11th circuit also covers uh, websites, uh, although the court of appeals is currently considering an appeal in that case. So no circuit has said they're not covered. Um, and then yeah. district courts in California, New York, Florida, Massachusetts, Vermont, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Ohio, and Michigan have found that websites are covered. And DOJ has said websites are covered, regardless of whether there's a nexus to a physical place. So, you know, companies have to ask themselves, does your website only show up in the fourth, fifth, or tenth circuit where you might be able to argue that websites aren't covered? or only in the ninth, sixth, and third circuits where you might be able to argue you don't have a physical place. Uh, that's, yeah. it's, it's, it's getting pretty clear that websites are covered and people have to take, have to take that into account. Um, but people have asked, you know, what do you mean the goalposts aren't moving? They changed from WCAG 1.0 to 2.0 to 2.1. Does that mean the goalposts are moving? Well, <clears throat> what do you think? No, I don't think the goalposts are moving. W WCAG 1.0 was, uh, was basic accessibility concepts. WCAG 2.0 fills the, them out a little more. And, and, and 2.0 and 2.1 have added more on mobile apps because there are specific ways of making those accessible and have added 2.1 in particular has added more for people with intellectual disabilities but doesn't change the basic concepts of how you make something accessible. So it doesn't feel like the goalposts are moving. It feels Actually, like they're clarifying. Yeah, clarifying is a very good word, Eve. I would say keeping pace with the technological <laughs> changes is another way of looking at it, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you think of work at 1.0 and the world in 1999, my God, websites were mostly about displaying information. They were mostly static. Now we have extremely dynamic web applications. And 
I can almost relate to the change in the standards as being critical in order to keep abreast of the technological changes. So when in 1999 or 2000, I was looking at testing of websites and web applications, applications was a very small concern, firstly. And secondly, it was, you know, we created technologies that could spider everything, follow the links on a page, <laughs> which seems like a joke today because we have all mm -hmm. these single page web apps and our technology had to change. So the underlying standard had to change. I mean, I think it is keeping pace. I remember WCAG 1.0 talked about the fact that if your website is not JavaScript enabled, what do mm -hmm. you have to do? It, that seems like a total joke today, in my opinion, <laughs> right? It doesn't happen. So if if I'm hearing you right, in any of the cases that you've talked about, in any of the circuit codes, whether it is the fourth, fifth, or tenth, sixth, ninth, or third, or any other, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like we need another ruling, right? I mean, it sounds like it's very clear that uh, websites are going to have to be made accessible. And I wonder what you think. You know, when I think about this, when I think about websites and mobile applications being made accessible and case law and the fact that we don't need another ruling because I think it's crystal clear what direction this is going in, I wonder if, you know, you talk about left-leaning liberal courts, right? <laughs> and I'm a capitalist. I don't know any of those courts. Right, right, <laughs> right. And I'm a capitalist at heart, right? So from my perspective, I think about the largest minority population in the United States. And I think about the market share. I think about loyal customers. I think mm -hmm. about the fact that I can earn you know, if somebody with a disability comes to my website or my native mobile app and they like it, they're probably not going to change as easily as somebody else, not be as fickle because they get used to it. And frankly, that's wonderful. I, I think of it as a really great market opportunity. But mm -hmm. somehow, you know, it seems like we are waiting around for not looking at the market share, not looking at the aging population, not looking at the way technology is changing the landscape, how we interact with things. I don't know if I'm going to do it via my Alexa or my Google Home, or I'm going to do mm -hmm. it through touch or some other method that has not even invented today. And all of that accessibility uh, standards help with all of that. Yet I keep hearing uh, this thing that we want regulations to come out of Department of Justice. What do you think of that? Well, I think that's so short-sighted <laughs> in that you're, you're currently turning away some 10 to 20% of your potential customers and hanging a sign out that says, I don't want your business go somewhere else. Yeah. Seems like a very poor business decision. So regardless of even if you didn't think you were required to do this, it might be wise to be the one who does because people will come to you. And thinking about the goodwill issue of having an inaccessible website requiring those customers and their families and friends to go through, find, reach you some other way that's harder than your website and then that makes it harder than your competitors. They're going to go to your competitors, but they're also going to feel bad about you. They're not going to like you. You're going to lose goodwill if your website's accessible and they can't see that you're fixing it. Uh, that's what leads, that frustration leads to lawsuits. Yeah. And it also just leads to terrible reputational damage. Yeah, I, I, I think you cannot even measure the, the impact, monetary impact <clears throat> of the brand damage that you're talking about because mm -hmm. I have a millennial, you know, and 
uh, besides being a pain and having me babysit the grand puppy, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, they wouldn't, they've got this whole social conscious way of buying mm -hmm. things, whether it's environmentally correct or it is buying from companies that really care about giving back. I think it's mm -hmm. a very big thing with the millennials and younger generation. And I'm so happy to see that actually, you know, that's great. And frankly, what you're saying, I think it's short-sighted for people to wait and it's short-sighted for people to say, well, you know, wait for the DOJ to, because right now, the fact that the DOJ has not come up with a standard what does that mean for companies? Does that, that give them increased leverage or freedom or flexibility from your perspective, Eve? The fact that DOJ hasn't said Work Act 2.0 is the standard, right? Eve? Did we lose the audio? Hi, Pretty, I can hear you. Hey, Eve, can you hear us okay? And she must be encountering a few technical difficulties. Let's give her a second. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I lost my audio. No, <laughs> no worries. No problem. <laughs> That's great. And uh, <clears throat> what would a live webinar be without some Murphy's Law, <laughs> you know, happening? So, uh, let me repeat the question, Eve. I was saying this is interesting because in a way, the Department of Justice, I mean, you said it's short-sighted that people shouldn't be acting and I couldn't agree more from a standards perspective, right? Um, don't wait for DOJ to tell you that you should be Work Act 2.0 or now 2.1 compliant because it's a well-known internationally accepted standard with tools and training and all kinds of technologies to help you and you would be future proofing yourself by doing that but the fact that the doj has not come out with a ruling today that follow work at 2.0 or 2.1 or any ruling right now what what does that mean from your perspective eve does that give companies further impetus to move now well, it gives them uh, freedom. So uh, people want to say, oh, but won't, won't complying with these standards make our website less creative and less cool? No, absolutely not. Number one, it doesn't make it less creative and less cool. People with, uh, without vision impairments or other disabilities won't actually notice, except that the, the website's likely to be better organized and easier to get around. So that's good for everybody, just like uh, curb ramps on the yes. sidewalks. They actually help everybody. Um, but the, re the, the, the standard under the ADA is effective communication. WCAG uh, 2.0 is the, and 1.0 before it, is the only internationally accepted standard for accessibility. It's been accepted in federal law. It's been uh, the uh, Section 508. It's been accepted in the Air Carrier Access Act. It's been accepted by courts and others who found that to meet the effective communication standard. But not having a regulation gives us businesses some freedom. If you're doing something fancy and new or you want to come up with a new way of making it accessible, you can do that. You have the burden of showing that it's making effective communication. But this is a benefit of the law, as one court said, not a bug that there aren't regulations and that the standard is effective communication. It gives you freedom to find the way that works best, that works well for people with disabilities, your customers with disabilities. That is very true, actually. That is a really interesting perspective, uh, Eve. I never even thought about the fact that it gives mm -hmm. you freedom if you're doing something new. Well, you know, and that's interesting because if I think about the amicus briefs in the Domino's case, mm -hmm. such as the National Retail um, Federation or Foundation, I'm not sure mm -hmm. what F stands mm -hmm. for, but and the National Retail uh, uh, group, they are, what should they be doing in your opinion? What should they be advising their membership? 
Well, they should be advising, of course, with the recent ruling. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. they should be advising their membership and helping their members make their websites accessible. So they should be they should be helping particularly small businesses know where to look for expertise and help, and where to find uh, website templates that are actually that start accessible, and how to label your images and your radio radio buttons and (laughs) fill out make your forms accessible. People can do it but they need to be pointed in the right direction of the resources. So they should be helping folks find those resources. And mm. then they should be worried. I would be worried that um, based on their position in the Supreme Court, that customers with disabilities and without disabilities will turn away from the members of that federation. I think you know the members should be worried that taking these positions that say we should be allowed to exclude people with disabilities from our services really does not play well. Mm -hmm. with both people with disabilities and their families and people who just care about equal access. So I would say, you know, customers or members of these organizations, we know your websites aren't accessible. It's very easy for anyone, person who's with a disability or without, to figure out whether a website's accessible or not. And if you don't know, chances are your website is not accessible. Yeah. (laughs) If you haven't asked about it. So they need to find out. First things first, find out. Get an audit done or even use an uh, online app and you'll be able to see a bunch of the problems. That's not the final answer usually, but that shows you a bunch of the problems. And then take action. Take action. Adopt a policy. Adopt an accessibility standard. Usually what you want is WCAG 2.1, level the AA, and invite comments on your on your policy figure out what your problems are make priorities for how you're going to fix them the things that are most important fix those first the things yeah. people really need fix those first mm-hmm. the things that are really easy to fix fix those first and then yeah. um, train your folks and train both what, what people forget is to train not just the people who code but the people who create your content because if it starts out accessible, it's harder to break it. <laughs> so, and then monitor and track and hold people accountable yeah. and regularly, regularly check and follow up on the things that aren't accessible. You know, what I'd like to say, Eve, um, because content is constantly changing in this dynamic, agile world where There are companies that are doing several updates to their websites and mobile applications every Mm -hmm. single day. It's not the world where we used to code for one year and then we used to Mm -hmm. release something, right? So I think people have to think about accessibility as a, not as a project, but as a program, Mm -hmm. ongoing program, right? (laughs) And Um, There have been many studies done by many tech giants that talk about finding a defect or finding an accessibility problem in production is as much as a hundred times more expensive to fix than fixing it, than preventing it in the first place, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. I find really interesting. I'll tell you why. You know, you've talked about transparency to the world, put out an accessibility statement and share with the world your roadmap, what you're doing, what you're planning to do, that you're not just simply like an ostrich sticking your head in the sand and pretending this is not a problem. And people Mm -hmm. are willing to be much more patient when they see that you're committed to this and you've got a roadmap, you've got process, you've got policies, all of that, right? And I think that's really terrific. And I think I see this almost as a a question of transparency to the public, but I also see it as a question of transparency to your employees. Because frankly, you know, I work with developers, right? I mean, that's what we've been trying to uh, really make this a business as usual, no brainer for development teams that they Mm -hmm. can do accessibility without adding much effort. They can get to an acceptable uh, level of accessibility without adding time to their development life cycle. That's been my whole thing, right? Because I wanted to make it easy. Otherwise people don't do it. And Mm -hmm. 
but I see that when I work with development teams, they want, they really care passionately about creating technology that is accessible to everybody. And so when you talk about transparency, I see it for transparency to the public and I see a transparency to your employees because they do care. You would, mm -hmm. don't want to be in a position to say, let's not tell our employees what we're doing because it sounds right. so awful, right? <laughs> yeah. And if you really want them to care, include it in their performance evaluations. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is very true. Now, Eve, you've touched upon this, but what do you think should be considered, I mean, undue burden for companies? What is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear well, it. Well, these days, these days, there's not a lot of undue burden. Undue burden is a defense under the ADA. So a company that okay. decides not to make something accessible on its website because it decides it would be too expensive or too hard can make the defense and they have to prove it, that it was an undue burden. But that's in light of all your company's available resources. So, mm -hmm. um, and two things about that. You have to not only make that case, but that case is, needs to be made by a decision maker at the relevant time and needs to be based on all the resources available. So what you usually need to do to make an undue burden defense is when you discover that something's inaccessible and you decide not to make it accessible, a decision maker high in the company with budgetary authority needs to say, okay, we've decided it's an undue burden because it costs as much and we only have this much. Usually these days, that's not gonna be about money so much as about time. It will take us this much time, so we're gonna do it in this much time and it would be an undue burden to do it more quickly. Um, but if you don't have that done in advance, that's a really mm -hmm. hard argument to make. And the courts are less um, happy with those arguments either. So when Dixie, for example, argued it would cost $250,000 for them to make their website accessible, the counter argument that was that it would cost thirty dollars or $40,000. And the court said, I don't care. Even $250,000 <laughs> is not an undue burden. You spent X millions of dollars redesigning your website or building your website in the first place. Yeah. So $250,000 is not an undue burden. Yeah, I think it so was 50 million or something like that. A lot of yeah. money, right, <laughs> compared to the 250,000, right. Yeah, I mean, sorry, you were going to say one other thing. I, Eve, please continue. No, that's okay. I mean, it may be an undue burden for new stuff. So new stuff that WCAG hasn't thought of. Uh, virtual reality. I think they're working on accessibility for virtual yeah. reality. Yep. If, you're, you're, if you create something that's never been done and you put it on your website and you can't figure it out, you've tried and tried and tried to figure out how to make this accessible, you know, that's where your most, most likely undue burden arguments are going to be. But the yeah. standard stuff that are on websites, yeah, it's all doable. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, you know. So, I mean, in terms of key takeaways for people attending this webinar or listening to a recording of our webinar. The next steps that companies should take given the Domino's decision. I mean, you've already said a few things. Do an mm -hmm. audit. Find out where you're existing. If, if you think it's not accessible, it probably isn't, you said, right? <laughs> um, yeah document things, be transparent, uh, address in, in prevention of defects in your new content, right? So existing content, yep. figure out how to stop the bleeding, document everything, and have an accessibility statement that shares publicly what you're doing, how you're prioritizing. You can't get to everything and at once, and people are going to be very, uh, Forgiving of that, I think, if that's the right word to use. Tell me what Patience. else. <laughs> Tell me, given this ruling, any other words of advice that you can give to companies? Well, I think the other lesson, which is mostly from the Winn-Dixie case, is that blaming it on a third party is very risky. So if oh. you have third party content on your website, chances are you're still responsible for it. And the Winn-Dixie court said, yes, Winn-Dixie has to make all, everything on its website accessible, including the third party content. And you often, I will hear from businesses and schools and governments 
Well, I get that from an outside vendor. I can't make them make that accessible. And I say, well, you're the, you're the covered entity here. They're not. So I would sue them. I'd love to. But I may not be able to, depending on the jurisdiction. So yeah. you're the public accommodation. And just like with your architect, you say, make sure it complies with the ADA. It's in the contract. It should be in the contract. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, there is in the precedence third, there, right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. In these third-party contracts, you're going to have to make, make it part of the contract that mm. they make sure it's accessible, that you're allowed to test it before they deliver it so that you don't have to go back and fix things that they broke after the fact. So there is some control. You have a contract with them. You pay them and yeah. so forth. Those are things that you, can, that you can use. You can also threaten to sue them. You're their customer. <laughs> that's true and they're denying you customers with disabilities yeah. um so so i would i would think that that's uh, an area that people have to think more about um what what third-party stuff are they using and have they done anything to make sure it's accessible very true and you know when we came up with open sourcing our axe browser extension inside of chrome or firefox the whole purpose was to at least let um, people reach the low hanging fruit without any pain. It's free, mm -hmm. there's no reason not to do it. So we need to keep lowering the barriers from a technology perspective, I think, to make this a no brainer for people. Um, mm -hmm. Right, I mean, to me, it's already becoming very difficult to make the undue burden uh, argument. And I think exclusions for third party, like you said, don't hold water anymore. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, and so we can only lower the barriers from a technology perspective to make it even easier for people to mm -hmm. make um, this equal rights issue a no brainer for them from a technology perspective. But I wonder if, as I'm thinking through this, you know, people keep going back to DOJ should have made a ruling. And Title III, which is what we're discussing today, ADA Title III, which is for public facing content, is really what is uh, coming up in conversations because of the Domino's ruling. But DOJ also had a Title I, uh, uh, you Title know, advance, sorry, Title II, advance notice of proposed rulemaking and frankly for employees of an organization as well which would be yet another no that was for that was for government state and local governments i don't think Only. the eoc has coming out with any anything for employees right but i mean what i mean is it's only a matter of time right <laughs> because we want the same accommodations the same access to be given to the public as we do to our employees because we want to increase the employment of people with disabilities, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I wonder if the same uh, short-sighted comment that you made applies to people thinking about the bigger picture of making technology accessible. Well, it does. I mean, we have companies who are getting sued now because they developed their a software that their employees have to use and they didn't make that accessible, which means they will not hire people with disabilities. That's flat out what it means. They say, well, we'll accommodate them, except it's not possible. Once you've developed the software or purchased the software, software and built it into all your employees' yeah. work, you can't just build it out or build a workaround for it. It becomes impossible for people to do their work, and it becomes a people with disabilities need not apply sign. It's really disastrous. It's very wow. short-sighted and it sets the companies up for discrimination lawsuits. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you, Eve. It's been illuminating for me as always. Every time I talk to you, I have to mm -hmm. get you cornered for a dinner so we can continue this conversation. <laughs> um, that would Laura, be great. <laughs> Laura and Ryan, yes, it would be great. Thank you, Eve, again. And Laura and Ryan, I know we wanted to leave a few minutes for questions and answers. So should we transition to that? If there are any questions from our audience? Yes, I have a great one here. So if accessibility is an ongoing practice, 
working towards WCAG AA, um, 2.0 AA, and continually addressing accessibility issues, mm -hmm. um, am I still liable for occasional issues? So is having an ongoing accessibility practice defensible in court? Um, my perception, my perspective is that it is. So the, in, the, in the ADA dealing with physical accessibility, temporary or minor, not minor, temporary interruptions of accessibility aren't, you can't sue over those. So if your elevator breaks and it's broken for half a day, that's not a violation of the ADA. Now, that's a problem for the person with a disability who can't use it. Yeah. but it's not technically a violation of the ADA. I think the same concept would apply here. Something broke and it was broken for a short period of time and you fixed it right away, then that's not, it's also not the kind of thing that most legitimate disability rights lawyers go around suing about. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's, that's the argument I would make is that yeah. it was a temporary interruption. But if it went on forever, it's not temporary. Well, and from a technological perspective, right? Uh, again, thinking of it like any other technology defect, you have uh, different criticalities or priorities that you give to your defects. So if it's a critical barrier that stops somebody in their tracks from being able to, say, do a transaction like order a pizza or buy uh, uh, something on your website that any other consumer or uh, uh, look at their billing statement. I would consider those much more critical. And if it's a showstopper, there's no workaround. Prioritize those and address those first because that can be very frustrating for people with disabilities to encounter a problem that they don't have a workaround for. Right. Great. And as a follow on to that, is there a precedent for the number of days a defect can um, go on before it is considered too long? Like some companies uh -huh. say 60 days. Is there, is there a legal precedent for that set yet? Not that I know of. 60 days is kind of a long time. <laughs> but no, I don't know of any court that that's said what the, what the maximum time is that would be considered temporary. And what we've done in, in settlements that we've done is we've required um, the companies to prioritize accessibility bugs the same way they prioritize security bugs. Yes. So put it really high up in your list of fixes. Yeah, and Eve, I guess it also depends upon your software development methodology and processes, right? If you have, for example, fully automated tests, regression tests, then to make accessibility testing as a part of that would take a, a lot less time. If your normal regression test cycle is 90 days, well, that's a problem in many other ways, but I don't think you would be faulted if it was taking you the same amount of time that it would take, like Eve said, to fix a security defect. Mm -hmm. So it depends upon that as well. And we know people are moving towards automating their tests and having shorter and shorter release cycles. Then it makes it difficult to have accessibility uh, <laughs> as an exception, you know, have that, in, uh, uh, you know, running on a much longer leash, if you will. Got to be consistent. Okay. Um, I have an interesting comment here. In response to the question asking whether um, there's still a need for GOA to put out um, another DOJ, you know, okay. Yep. Yeah. So they say, you know, sometimes for a large corporation, the business value budget is in a different bu um, bucket than the regulatory bucket. So they, ha they have to compete with other business value, um, which is why it should be um, an, a, a broad reaching regulation. Do you have um, anything in response to that comment? Yeah, luckily it already is in the regulation. It's in the ADA regulation that calls for effective communication and the courts have held that that applies to websites. So that's a legal requirement and that should be treated by as a compliance issue. I know my colleague, Lainey Feingold says you should do it for reasons other than compliance and I agree, but you should 
do it for compliance if that's the only reason you can, you can do it. <laughs> do it one way yeah. or the other. Um, so yeah, it's in the regulations already. This is a legal mandate and mm. should be treated as seriously as any other legal mandate. If, um, you know, <laughs> I, that's a really interesting question. Biz value budget versus compliance budget. And I understand the struggles that companies have to go through to get money towards prioritizing something. I, I would just add to your answer that Google is the biggest deaf and blind user you have. So if you're looking to get <laughs> business value budget, talk about how much money your search engine optimization efforts are going to spend and say accessibility is going to actually help with those efforts as well. <laughs> okay, so we've got another question here. Um, what's your take, Eve, or even pretty on the Taco Bell lawsuit um, that the defendant's app does not need to meet WCAG 2.1 A level of accessibility? Um, go ahead. I'm not, I'm not very familiar with the Taco Bell website. If you're talking about the difference between websites and apps, that hasn't been explored very, very fully. Um, whether if you have a website and an app, they both have to be accessible. <clears throat> but pretty certainly, if the website and the app do different things, then they both have to be accessible. So for example, we recently worked with a credit union because they and they needed to make both their website and their app accessible because their mobile app could do things that the website could not do like mobile deposits and it gave you a variety of different tools that the desktop website did not do so they need to make both of those accessible mm -hmm. um, but the courts haven't gone into um, much detail a couple of places have have dealt with it a little bit on if you have a website and a mobile app that do exactly the same thing, do you have to make them both accessible? Yeah. And Laura, talking about Domino's, Taco Bell is making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it looks like we have some questions here that are more specific, so I'm going to save those for answering offline. Um, because we are now at the end of today's webinar and pretty you're hungry, <laughs> so I won't keep you from your life. <laughs> um, I want to thank Eve and uh, Pretty for a great discussion. I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. And don't forget that we'll be sending out the recording to everybody via email. And I hope you have a great rest of your uh, Monday afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Eve, once again. Bye-bye.